Listen, we have a great message today. Today we're going to be talking about the mystery of Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah. We had the discussion about the mystery of Rosh Hashanah, and then we had the mystery of, of Yom Kippur, and we had the mystery of Sukkot. Hoshana Rabbah, I think, is a celebration that is sometimes overlooked, but it has immense significance. It is, as we're going to find out today, on par with Yom Kippur, although, of course, not observed in the same fashion. Hoshana Rabbah is the last and greatest day of Sukkot. It is not a Yom Tov, so it's not necessarily a day that you must cease from working and so forth. However, it is highly encouraged to do that if you are able. And I, I said it's the last day of Sukkot because keep in mind that Sukkot is a seven-day seven, seven holiday, but there is an extra day, an eighth day, called Shemini Atzeret Simchat Torah. And in th- that's really kind of the last day of the holiday season, but actually it's a, it's a holiday unto itself. Okay? So Hoshan Rabbah is the last day of the Sukkot holiday. So we'll be talking about the mystery of Hoshan Rabbah, why it's so important. And I think we'll start with an insight from, um, uh, from the Machzor and then kind of build upon that. We'll kind of uh, go with that. So let's state our state, rather, our blessing as we dive into this teaching. Blessed are you, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, on our God, sweeten the words of our Torah in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, I, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Amen. I think what you're going to see today in the message, what I want you to see anyway, is that Hashem is a God of grace and mercy, and that built within the Torah and the oral Torah is a message of grace and mercy, of second chances and third chances and opportunities for God to reach out to us and say, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you another opportunity. And that's what Hoshana Rabbah is really about. Hoshana Rabbah is that last chance beyond the last chance. We read in the Haftarah today. Um, there's actually there's actually two Haftarot because it's a double portion. We read the Haftarah for Nitzavim, which is a great Haftarah. The word Lapid is used. This is where uh, it's in this Torah, this Haftarah rather where the, the name Lapid Judaism was originally derived, where it says in chapter 62 in verse 1, For Zion's sake I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not be still until, until her righteousness goes forth like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. The word torch is Lapid there. And so it's a great portion. This, the, par, the, the, the portion for Vayelech, comes from a, a multitude of sources. It's Hosea 14, 2 through 10, Joel 2, 11 through 27, and the, the last part, which I'm really going to focus on, is Micah 7, 18 through 20. What's really great about the portion in Joel is that Hashem is talking about the fact that, you know, we're going to make teshuva. We're going to repent. We're going to blow the shofar in Zion, and we're going to make repentance. And then when we do, he's going to restore the blessing to us. And there's a famous line in here um, in verse 25. This is Joel chapter 2. It says, I will repay you for the crops, the years that the various types of locusts, the Arbe, the Yelek, the Hatzil, the Agamas, and some translation it says, what the pomper worm and canker worm stole from you. And he goes on to say, my great army that I sent against you. And you shall eat, and you shall be sated, and you shall praise the name of Hashem your God. So in other words, 
This is one of those moments where we get to do remember, uh, uh, last week and the I think it was last week and the Alia day. Um, I said we're gonna start a new thing we're gonna use around here called Beyond the Comma, right? And then uh, Leah went out and and made some uh, memes for that, which was great. Beyond the comma, because a lot of people, a lot of times we don't go beyond the comma in a verse, and therefore we miss something. I'm going to restore to you the years, and I'm just going to use the, the I think I like the way it sounds. The, I'm going to restore to the years that the pumper worm and the canker worm stole from you. Comma, the great army I sent against you. See, we got to remember that. You say, well, that, that sounds kind of bad. I mean, he, he's the one who sent these worms, these locusts against us that destroyed our crops, destroyed our blessing. Yes, he did. But the comma and beyond it is important in the sense that we have to understand that, A, he sent it against us because we were disobedient. But, B, he's going to restore the crop because he's merciful. You see, God's punishment to us is all about our restoration. You see, the goyim, they, you know, through the letters of Paul, they were taught that God punished Israel because he doesn't like Israel. He's mad at Israel. We rejected him, so he's done with us. He wipes his hands with us, and he punishes us. So in the Gentile mind, punishment is all about retribution. It's all about taking out vengeance. We're sinners in the hand of an angry God. But that's not how a loving father thinks about his children. A loving father disciplines his children, yes. Sometimes takes them out to the woodshed. Yes, he does. But the purpose is to correct their behavior and cause them to grow up to be good, law-abiding, God-fearing, righteous, honorable men. That's the whole point. And so, yes, he sent the, uh, the army against us. Yes, it, it caused a lot of uh, pain. But the point was to bring us to a point of repentance. So this year is going to be the year that God restores to us what the pumper worm and the canker worm stole from us, that great army that he sent against us. It says in the book of Micah in the same reading, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20, it says, Who, O God, is like you who pardons iniquity and overlooks transgressions for the remnant of of his heritage, who has not retained his wrath eternally, for he desires kindness. He will again be merciful to us. He will suppress our iniquities and cast into the deep depths of the sea all our sin. Grant truth to Jacob and kindness to Abraham as you swore to our forefathers from ancient times. Now, this is again, comes from, from the prophets, the Jewish prophets like Micah, who were keeping the laws of Moses, living a Jewish life, and they're making a very emphatic declaration, and that is that God is merciful, he's kind, he's full of grace, and he overlooks our iniquities. You see, grace did not come with the old rugged cross. Grace has been existent since the beginning. Indeed, the sages bring down that God created teshuva before creation. That teshuva, the power and gift of teshuva, preceded creation. Now, this is important because it means that this is why I should say that when we make teshuva, when we really do break our hearts and ask God to forgive us and seek his forgiveness and begin to walk anew in his light, then God has the capability to go back in time to that point of transgression and remake it into a point of merit. How, how and why can he do that? Because teshuva was before time. See, time has no power over teshuva because it was created after Teshuva. Now, what does this have to do with Hoshana Rabbah? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the Machzor of Hoshana Rabbah, or excuse me, of Sukkot, there is a little section that precedes the blessings of Hoshana Rabbah. 
And in that section, it says the Zohar in Zav 31b describes Hoshana Rabbah as a judgment day akin to Yom Kippur itself. For on Hoshana Rabbah, the parchments containing the Yom Kippur decrees are made final. Consequently, Hoshana Rabbah assumes a special importance as a day of prayer and repentance. On Hoshana Rabbah, all the people, or excuse me, on Rosh Hashanah, all the people were judged. The righteous were given a, fa- given a favorable judgment. Those found wanting but not completely evil were given until Yom Kippur to repent. If they failed to do so, the verdict against them was written and sealed. And, however, it was not yet delivered. That is not done until Hoshana Rabbah, a day when Jews assemble in prayer, dedication, and supplication. Therefore, the joy of Sukkot reaches its climax, not in revelry, but in devotion. In his mercy, God finds ample reason, it says, to tear up the parchments bearing harsher sentences and replace them with brighter tidings. The joy, I love what it said, the joy of Sukkot is not, the climax of the joy is not reached in revelry, but in devotion. We conclude the holiday with the greatest and most joyful day by saying to God, I'm asking you to forgive me and wash away my sins and purify me. I want to draw near to you in holiness. Now, I want you to catch the sequence of events because it's crucial to the heart of God. Rosh Hashanah, we're going to come here in a few days. We're going to hear the shofar blast. We're going to, that is going to begin the trial. Our trial begins. That's why God says, don't wait until then. Go ahead and start now. The 25th of Elul, uh, Yosef mentioned it. We begin every night, beginning tonight, and every night moving forward to Rosh Hashanah, this is the time to recite the silikot, the silikot, the prayers of forgiveness. We, we, every, beginning tonight, we just sit down and take some time every night to say, God, forgive me. And, and, and make it personal. There might be things that you need to ask Hashem to forgive you of and think about those things. But then we come to Rosh Hashanah and we hear the shofar blast and God ma- begins to make the judgment. Are you totally righteous? Are you somewhere in between? And frankly, the, are you too completely evil, God forbid? We should all see ourselves as in the balance. Every sage writes, they don't care who the sage is. They say, I'm in the balance. And then we spend the next 10 days making teshuva. We come to Yom Kippur. And we spend the whole day of Yom Kippur fasting and praying and reciting prayers. It's it's the longest synagogue service of the whole year. We pray. We beat our chest. We ask God to sincerely forgive us. Then we stand up here, the Neila service, the closing of the gates, and the Zekanim will stand here at the ark, and the ark will be opened, and the Hazan will be up here, and I'll be up here. I'll be blowing the shofar. And as the shofar is blown, these gates of the, of the ark are being slowly, slowly closed, and we're beckoning people. If, you, if you've left something on the table, deal with it now. Deal with it now before these gates close. And this is what it's talking about, the ten virgins. They were banging on the, let us in, let us in. The gates were already closed. That's the illusion. At least the Messiah was talking about. But see, God is so graceful and so full of mercy that he says, even if you did not repent fully by the time those gates were closed, and even if I have written on a parchment and sealed it with the the king's seal, that this is your decree for the coming year, he slow walks it. To the court clerk. Now, once it gets to the court clerk, it's it's put in the file, and that's it. But he slow walks it. If you come to Hoshana Rabbah, he says, "I've 
by the end of this day, this is going to be filed in the heavenly court's clerk's office. But I want you to know, I can tear it up right now if you'll make teshuva. Now, none of us know fully, right? So I don't know about you, but whatever, whatever it is, I want Hashem to know that I'm going to take every opportunity. I'm going to make teshuva on Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to take, make teshuva on Rosh Hashanah day two. I'm going to take, I'm going to make teshuva on the next day and the next day and the next day. I'm going to make teshuva on Shabbat, the Shabbat of return. I'm going to make teshuva on, on Kol Nidre. I'm going to make teshuva on Yom Kippur. And I want to be making teshuva on Hoshana Rabbah. But that's the heart of God. He doesn't want anybody to left behind. Even if you, if something held you back, God says, I want to give you a chance. And I know that Hashem has given lots of people chances. He's given us chances. So what happens on Hoshana Rabbah? What is, there's, there's interesting things about this. What is it that makes it, what's the origins of it? Hoshana Rabbah is this day that we come to the synagogue. And uh, look, we're going to have lots of services. And we're going to, I have slides I'll show you during the announcement portion of the services we're going to have at Rosh Hashanah, all the meal planning that you need to do for Rosh Hashanah. And then we're going to have, we have services coming up from Kol Nidre and then Yom Kippur and then during Sukkot. It's a lot, but it's all great. It's all great. Okay? We're not like other people. We don't get like one holiday a year or two holidays a year. We get a whole bunch of holidays a year. You know, if you think about it, by the way, right now, and I know you've seen it because you've gone to the store, whatever store you go to, and there are aisles and aisles of merchandise for a particular holiday that celebrates death and, and evil and, and witchcraft and sorcery. I have a teaching on it on the channel. Actually, it was, it was not my teaching. It's Daniel. Daniel did the teaching, actually. Um, that holiday, by the way, is, is pagan in its origin, yes, but it's, it's Christian in its spread. Christianity took that holiday and made it global. Okay? It was a Celtic holiday. It's interesting that it happens about the same time of year as Sukkot. Sukkot is a celebration of life, a celebration of goodness, a celebration of godliness, it's a, it's a celebration of, of denying idolatry, denying the power of witchcraft, denying the power of evil, and coming back to God. It's such an interesting contrast. You have the celebration of death and evil, and then you have the celebration of life. And our goal here at Lapid Judaism is to pull people into life. So going back to this discussion... During Sukkot, we have the lulav, which is the palm branch, the myrtle branch, the willow, and we have the most beautiful fragrance in the entire world, better than any perfume, which is the esrog. It's amazing. Sometimes I just sit around with the esrog and I just smell it. It's so wonderful. It looks like a giant lemon. But we, we have these and we wave them during the days of Sukkot, and then once a day, we're uh, traditionally, you, you circle the bima with one time with the, lul, with the lulav. Now, you don't have to be at the synagogue to do this. You could circle your living room, right? You could make it, and you can. This is actually a halakhic thing. You can, you can make a circle. You can make a circle in your, I, I, I make a cir circle in the sukkah, okay? I just said your living room if you don't have a sukkah, but you could, you could make a circle in your sukkah. Something you could do just as an idea. You could take your humash or your tanakh or your siddur or all of it, put it on a table in the middle of your sukkah and walk around the sukkah with your lulav. Okay? Because what happened in the temple times is that we would march around the altar with our lulav and we would say a prayer. All these prayers are in your, in your um, magzor. 
and in the synagogue, a lot of times what happens is if, if you're here, then you can put the Torah on the bima or somebody can stand at the bima holding the Torah and you make a circle like that. On Hoshana Rabbah, this is done seven times. We make a circle around the bima seven times when we say these particular prayers. It says in the Mishnah, Sukkah 4 5, it says, How was this mitzvah performed? It says, There was a place below Jerusalem, a place called Matzah. They descended there and they would gather up large willow branches and come and stood them up against the sides of the altar with their tops drooping over the top of the altar. They blew the shofar. They blew the tekiah, a teruah, a tekiah each day, and they would circle the altar one time and say, Ana Adonai Hoshiana, Ana Adonai Hatzlikana. Please, Adonai, save now. Please, Adonai, bring success now. And they would also say, Ani Vohu Hoshiana, Ani Vohu, which are two mystical names of God. Ani Vohu, bring salvation now. But on that day, on Hoshana Rabbah, they would circle the altar seven times. And when they left, what did they, what did they say? They would say, beauty is yours, O altar. Beauty is yours, O altar. And Rabbi Eliezer said, they would say to Yah and to you, O altar, to Yah and to you, O altar. So it says that this part of the, of the, the service was actually communicated to Moses on Mount Sinai. And throughout the era of the first temple, it was limited to the temple courtyard. When the second temple was built, the Arava service, that's the willow service, the Arava, was broadened. The prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who were members of the great assembly. Now, remember how people say, all these laws of the Jews, they just come from, te- from, from men. That's true. Men such as Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, Zerubbabel, Mordecai, and others. You know, men who have, like, books in the Bible that they wrote. So, yeah. It's not Fred and Frank and Tommy. These are, like, real prophets, okay? So it says here, they instituted the custom that on Hoshana Rabbah, Jews could take part in the Avra service wherever they were, even outside the temple courts. This is recorded in the Talmud at Sukkah 44a. After the temple was destroyed, the practice of circuits in the Arava service came to an end for a short while, but the people of Israel did not forget. And it goes on to say how they began, as I just said, to practice it in the synagogues and even in their own sukkahs. Rabbi Yisrael Amir HaKohen, better known as the Hafez Haim, enlarges upon the, the theme and explains that the connection between the altar and the holy temple and the bima in the synagogue, the bima represents the altar, is based upon a Talmudic exegesis regarding the covenant between the parts. Which, by the way, the covenant between the parts is the first place in the, in the Torah where the word lapid is used. It was the flame that came and, and went between the parts. It was called the lapid. So it says, when God promised Abraham that he would be given the land of Canaan, Abraham said, basically, how are you going to, how, how do I know this is true? The Hafez Haim says it's remarkable that Abraham, who knew God so personally and who had been saved in so many miraculous ways, would actually question God, how should I know? By this time, you would think that Abraham would just have faith. But that's the problem is that Abraham is a human being, just like all of us. The Talmud explains Abraham's question. Abraham said before HaKadosh Baal Kul, Master of the world, perhaps heaven forbid, Israel will sin before you. And you will do to them as you've done to the generation of the flood or the generation of dispersion. Now, when God responded that he would not do so, Abraham asked, Master of the world, whereby shall I know that you will not do so? Abraham asked, Master of the world, how shall I know what to teach my children regarding how their sins will be atoned for? God replied, bring me three heifers, which is an allusion to the altar. Once again, Abraham said, Master of the world, it's fine for the error of the holy temple, 
But in the period after the destruction of the temple, what will become of them? And he said, I have already set forth the Torah passages relating to the order of the sacrifices. And God said to Abraham, wherever and whenever they read the passages related to the sacrifices, I will consider it as if they had actually offered the sacrifices. Thus the Hophet's time concluded. If the reading of the Torah passages takes the place of the actual sacrifices, then the bima upon which the Torah is read signifies the temple altar. It's interesting to me and never ceases to amaze me that the bima is the place that we just said signifies the outer altar of the temple courts. And it's also the place that we take the Torah and stretch it out on the altar. And the Messiah is a Torah made flesh. Indeed, Halakha, Jewish Halakha stipulates that if you don't have ten men for the minion, but say you only have nine, then you can count the Torah scroll as the tenth man. Another interesting aspect of this, because every day I said uh, during Sukkot, we go around one time. On the last day, on Hoshana Rabbah, we go around seven times. And the sages brought down that this is indicative to teach us that it's like unto Jericho. Rabbi Hiya further taught in Yalkut Tehillim 703 that the Hakafa circuit, that's what that's called, the Hakafa, the Hakafa circuits of Sukkot correspond to an encirclement of Jericho by Joshua and the Israelite army as described in the sixth chapter of, of the book of Joshua. And Adonai said to Joshua, See, I've given to you Jericho. You shall go around the city and circle it each day one time. Thus shall you do for six days. And on the seventh day, you shall circle it seven times. And he, Joshua, caused the Ark of Hashem to go around the city, encircling one time. So they did so for six days. And on the seventh day, they went around the city and the manor seven times. They walked around, and the wall sank into its place. It says the connection between Jericho and Hoshana Rabbah is explained by Rabbeinu Bakya in this way. On this seventh day of Sukkot, Israel completed its de decreasing order of 70 sacrifices that served to invoke God's protection on the Gentile nations and also invoke the greatest benefit that they could possibly gain, that they be shorn of their illusory power and become subservient to the nation that represents God's will on earth. This doesn't mean that they become slaves to Israel, no but they become submissive to the teachings of Israel, which is the Torah. You know, I, I, I watched the teaching this week by Rabbi Singer on conversion. It was really not about conversion. It was about trying to push people into the Noahide movement. Now, I like Rabbi Singer, and I agree with most everything he says but not this video. He said something that when I heard it, I just shook my head. Now, you have to understand that I said earlier the Messianic Gentile is one twin and the Noahide is another twin. But what Rabbi Singer said, and I just, even as I think about it, I just think it's so nonsensical. He said that it's possible for a Gentile to take upon themselves the faith of Israel without taking upon themselves to become a member of the nation of Israel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I respect Rabbi Singer a whole lot. But that's simply false. The faith, in, what, he, what he was trying to say is, the faith of Israel is faith in the, monothe the monotheistic deity Hashem. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not the faith of Israel. Do we believe in one true God? Yep, we do. But that's not the faith of Israel. 
The faith of Israel is Torah. Torah. That's the heartbeat of Israel. That's the foundation of Israel. That's the faith of Israel. It is impossible to take upon yourself the faith of Israel and not join the nation of Israel. It's impossible. Okay? To try to separate the two is to do just what Paul did with the Messianic Gentile. This is what happens when you just don't go with truth, 100% truth. And I will also say this. A lot of times Rabbi Singer's videos are just, they're, they're on point. They're sharp. This one was jaded. It was all over the place. And that's because when you start getting into non-truth, it gets all messed up. It was, it, I'm just, I'm just going to throw that out there. I like him a lot, but that was what he's teaching is this bogus with respect to that. It says here that the nations of the earth have to become, become subservient to the nation that represents God's will on earth. What's God's will on earth? Torah. God's will on earth is Torah. And by the way, it says that the nations are going to come. It says in Isaiah, they're going to come to, they're going to, come to Jerusalem to learn the seven Noahide laws. Mm-mm, doesn't say that, does it? It says they're going to come learn Torah. I could, I could talk a lot about this video, but I'm not going to do it anymore. It says, so the circuits of the altar and the bema are both evocative of Jericho, not merely in commemoration of an ancient event, but of the continuing goal of human history, which is that evil disappear and mankind recognize the purpose for which it was created. Why were you created? I went over this in the in the beginning uh, as we came out of the worship time, the music time. You were created to keep Torah. You were created to keep Torah. First, he says, it was Jericho. Then it was all 70 nations. Now it is primarily Edom, the embodiment of evil, descendant of Esau and Amalek, initiator of the current exile that has plunged mankind into nearly two centuries of darkness. Do you know why we have the dark ages or had the dark ages? Because Torah was nearly eradicated from the earth. The dark ages were the dark ages. Think about it. We went from the, the, the intelligence, okay, granted they were immoral, but the intelligence of Rome and Greece and even before that, Egypt, the libraries of Alexandria, to the, we, like Europe was plunged into barbarism. What, how do we go from we can read Greek and hieroglyphics to, to being barbarians? The answer is Torah, a lack of Torah in the earth. And so here what it's saying is, when we go around the circles of the Bema on Hoshana Rabbah, what we're doing is we're circle, encircling spiritual Jericho. And we're, we're praying and believing that the blindness that is on the nations is going to come off and they will turn from their idolatry. They'll turn from their wickedness. They'll turn from that evil holiday that we, we have coming up in October. They'll turn from that and, and come into a holiday of life. Anybody notice, by the way, just as a quick side note, how the decor for that wicked holiday has increased in the last few years? Do you know they, they now have Halloween trees? Oh, yes. Go, go to some of these decorative stores, these big places that do home deco and stuff. You will see Halloween trees. And across the aisle is the twin, the Christmas tree. Now, if that doesn't turn you off, for those of you who are still like, well, I don't know, Christmas is kind of fun. If that doesn't turn you off, I don't know what else to tell you. The same guy owns both trees. The Satan. 
Decorating a tree, by the way, and displaying it is inter- inherently pagan. Did you know that you're not in the in the ancient temple? We were not allowed to even have a tree anywhere in the temple grounds for this very reason. Because pagans love to worship trees. You know, they were the original tree huggers. But seriously, they love to worship trees and they had these astro poles, and as a result, you're not allowed to have it we're not, not allowed to have a tree in the temple. And certainly not near the altar. Just leave the tree alone. Let the tree be. Leave it alone. Now, this time here, as we said earlier, is a time of judgment. As we mentioned a second ago, just like on Rosh Hashanah, we're coming to pray. Just like on Yom Kippur, we're coming to pray. And Hoshana Rabbah, again, God is slow walking that decision to the court clerk. And if you say, you know what, I didn't really get in the prayers and I didn't really, I mean, even if you miss, if you miss Rosh Hashanah and you miss Yom Kippur for some reason, then you need to be here for Hoshana Rabbah for sure. Nobody, by the way, should miss uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. Nobody should miss that. Everybody should come from Africa to, to be a part of the synagogue on those days. This is, so here, here's the great mystery of Hoshana Rabbah. The Zohar describes it again as a day of judge, a judgment in which the, your verdict has been sealed but not yet delivered. This is the delivery day of your judgment. And God, if it's a bad judgment, hasve shalom, hasve shalom. God wants to tear it up. But you know what the good news is? Here, here's how Hashem works. If he has Yaakov, just to use, or Yosef, or anybody, if he's written a negative decree for any of you or me, he looks for an opportunity to tear it up. If he has written for you, Yaakov, or you, Yosef, or for me or anybody else, a positive decree, he, he cannot tear it up. God can only tear up negative decrees, but not positive ones. That's his own rules. As a result of the mystery of this day, it is customary to remain awake late into the night of, of the era of Hoshana Rabbah and study Torah and other passages of repentance to draw near. As I said earlier, it, it's, it's not necessarily a Yom Tov, but people do re- refrain or try to refrain from working at least during the morning service because the effect is, the intent rather, is to, to focus on this time. There's also a unique um, custom during this uh, day, and it's called the beating of the willows. And this is where we take the willow out of our lulavim, and we say a particular blessing, and we beat the willow five times on the ground and leave them there. It's a very interesting custom. You might be saying, well, what's all that about? Well, it's, it's, it's mentioned that the willow, the shape of the willow leaf looks like a mouth, looks like lips. And so one of the reasons given for the beating of the willow on this, at this time is to make teshuva for all the times that we used our mouth inappropriately. We've spoken curses. We've spoken Lashon Hara. And so instead of God beating us on the mouth, we beat the mouth, as it were, on the ground, and we also uh, do so taking authority over the Satan. Now, one couple of final things here. I want to emphasize the aspect of God's mercy and how it says here in another insight that the king looks for ways. This is one of the things that's written in one of the insights of this holiday 
that the king looks for reasons to forgive you. He looks for reasons. And one of the ideas is, is that when he comes in to the synagogue, his, when the Shekinah comes into the synagogue and he sees his people in attendance and the men walking around the bema and everybody, all the women rejoicing, the king says, well, they're rejoicing in me as the king. Perhaps they have become new creations and he wipes away all of our transgressions. It's just indicative of the, it's so counter to what people say they, this, about Judaism and Torah. God, Hashem, looks for reasons to forgive us. He searches for reasons to forgive us. And, you know, the lie is you've got to keep the law of Moses perfectly. That's such a lie. God says, if you'll just do a little bit, if you'll just make a little bit of teshuva, I'll, I will run to you. One, one other thing about this, by the way, um, is that the sages teach that the seventh heaven and the highest of the heavens is called the Aravolt, the willow, the willow heaven. This is another reason why we come to this area. It's interesting because we end up beating the willow. To me, it's like the suffering Messiah because the Messiah, through the Messiah, the atoning work of the Messiah, we have the capability of reaching the seventh heaven and even beyond the seventh heaven, which is the throne of God. And we do that when the willow, the seventh heaven, takes the punishment for us. Instead of us being stricken on the mouth, we strike the willow in order to bring atonement for us. And then finally, there's an interesting insight that Rabbeinu Bakia brings down. I'll conclude with this. He notes that Hoshana Rabbah is the 21st day from Rosh Hashanah when Adam and Eve were created. And it's also the 26th day from the beginning of creation for God began to create the heavens and the earth on the 25th of Elul. Thus, he writes, Hoshana Rabbah is both a day number 21 and a day number 26, two numbers with profound symbolism. 21 is the numerical value of the name Yahu, which, which the Kabbalistic teach is God's fixed, is when God, the name with which God fixed the three dimensions of nature, of physical creation, stamping himself as the king of the universe in all of its directions, east, west, north, and south, up and down. 26 is the numerical value of the four-lettered name of God, which expresses his essence, the name that is called Shemo HaGadol, the great name. When a person is described as great or an event is described as great, like Gadol, or its Aramaic translation, Rabbah or Rava, the implication is that it has reached its holiness to the very pinnacle greatness of God's own great name. Such things as the Moses, the temple, the Kohen Gadol are described in this way as Gadol. And so is Hoshana Rabbah. It's the great day, literally the great Hoshana. So let no one think that the title of the day refers to nothing more than the multitude of its Hoshana prayers. That, though, too, is implied in the great name. There is much more to this day and its awesome holiness. Therefore, when we come to Hoshana Rabbah, we're connecting with God's deep creation of the entire universe, and we're connecting with his great name that brings us to the pinnacle of holiness. This is the mystery of Hoshana Rabbah. It's like the third part of the trifecta of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Hoshana Rabbah, that triangle, as it were, of Teshuvah. Amen ve amen.